cool. Yeah, so uh, I thought particularly interesting was the title of your latest solo record. You can kind of talk about how you how you got to that. Well, you know, it, it came from uh, being in quarantine, of course. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, what it was, man, is I've been on tour, like, these guys, Kyle Tuttle, he's mm-hmm. both Jeff Austin band, and Jared Poole plays on Larry Keel's band. And uh, while we were out, that was, like, March 5 to 9, maybe, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And, like, somewhere in that time period, things started getting, like, kind of weird on the road. Really? You could, like, kind of tell, you know, because there had been talk about the coronavirus since, like, you know, mid, mm-hmm. mid-February, mid really. Right. yeah. And, frankly, I made some ill-placed jokes even from oh, the really? stage. Like, I, I had been drinking Palomas, you know, grapefruit juice and tequila. <laughs> and one, one day I was, like, kind of hungover mm-hmm. for the show, and I said into the microphone, uh, I kind of have the Paloma virus. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I'm like looking back and like, man, that did not age well. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> well, you know, at the beginning, I mean, it mostly seemed like something that was invading other countries. I don't think a lot of people thought it was and going to come And it seemed here. like another one of those like sort of pandemics, you know, but like that you hear about, like, mm-hmm. but it doesn't actually affect your life. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, not that that should be joked about really, but at any rate, you know, somewhere in that process, we were like, God, I hope this doesn't, you know, like get out of control mm, because right. the music industry sort of got hit by it first to some mm. degree. Like um, South by Southwest canceled. Right. And I remember saying to, to a friend, like, I wonder if this is the first of like months of festivals that will be canceled. Like I said that like March 10th or something. Yeah. So anyhow, like by March 11th or whatever, just mm-hmm. a couple of days after this, it had like already become apparent that we are like, we've got like a, you know, a serious mm-hmm. issue at hand. And, you know, knowing myself and how it works for me to go stir crazy. Yeah. I was like, I could use a project and maybe, you know, I'll be able to make some material in the next next couple of weeks really that mm-hmm. will uh, resonate with folks and maybe get them through a time like this. Um, maybe it'll bring them some laughter. Maybe it'll, you know, say some like typical music things, say some things that you can't say with words. Yeah. We're talking about quarantine, right? Yeah. Quarantine tangerine. Cause, quarantine you, had, cause tangerine. you had another one that you released this year. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Talking about quarantine tangerine, but, Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, on March 9th, Low Income Porridge got released. And that had been like a year and a half in the making. Right. So that was March 9th, and Quarantine Tangerine was April 7th. You really turned that thing out fast. Yeah, less yeah. than a month. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I just set up like a makeshift home studio. And, uh, Mm-hmm. You know, I did some writing with my friend who's a poet down in Milwaukee, Pete Kahn is his name. Huh, okay. And uh, I texted him actually the first track of the album. I texted him and said, hey, let's see if we can write because we've been writing together, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, let's see if we can write a song that might be good for people, you know, right, right. now. And knowing Pete, I expected like a sarcastic response of some sort. <laughs> and... uh no response wow. about two hours later he sent me the lyrics of the first track of oh, wow. quarantine tangerine i huh. wrote the music on the spot and had it recorded most of it by the end of that night so what does your songwriting process look like songwriting process um morphs because mine is like i write a song and then two weeks later i hate it and i tear it up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i try to be I try to see them as little time capsules, huh. you know, that's like that's your thoughts and feelings mm-hmm. in a moment. It doesn't, you know, sometimes they quote unquote age well, You're like, yeah, I still believe the song. Other times you mm-hmm. sing a song, you know, or hear yourself back you know, even weeks later and you're like, I don't know what the hell this guy's right. saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, for me, it's, yeah. I try to not be, too critical of mm-hmm. myself and just like let these things flow and I write frequently and some of it you know I end up liking and some of it I don't but 
you know, it's just mm -hmm. a time capsule, something yeah. from a moment, you know. And do you, um, here, I think I'm gonna adjust the camera too. Well, but you can sit there. You can keep talking. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I. While, while you're, if you're writing, do you tend to write, do you write the words first and then match the music to it? Or do you do it the opposite way? Or how does that, or is it kind of all coming together at once? It can be any, any of those. Any of them, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, when I write with Pete, obviously I have the words. He's written the lyric, the lyrics, and then I I end up writing the uh, the chords, which is basically like a really easy process for me too, because it's like the words sort of feel um, a certain way. Yeah, you know, and and to me, it's easy to match music to that. Um, so yeah, and then. Other times it all kind of comes out at once. I mean, there's times where, you know, Jeff Austin used to do this too, where you would just turn on the recorder and then just like chill in your living room and just start singing whatever came from you mm -hmm. and then listen back and see if there's anything you'd find compelling and, pull out. Yeah. and then build from that. And do you, you find, know? do you ever find yourself like, I don't know, you're out at a bar, you're like maybe on the on the stream fly fishing or something, you think, and something just kind of comes to you and you're like, oh, I, I like that little bit. Oh, all the time. Yeah. Or somebody yeah. says something like, like here, I have a word pad in my cell phone right here. Like, let's just see like what's in the, um, yeah, Wabi Sabi, yeah. uh, Tomorrow River Rose, Ribs and Rhubarb, <laughs> Bibles and Tear Gas. <laughs> To live is to suffer. Um, oh, nope. <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> Holy ghost, I'm toast. I mean, we're for sure in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, so I mean, just, you know, trying to catch little things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, yeah. this is, you know. And then it's funny because I look back at this and, like, some of it did become a song. Like, everybody's a Southpaw, it says here. And that's that about <laughs> that's about when streaming started. Oh, Everybody yeah. was left-handed because oh. <laughs> you have to like change an iPhone. You have to change some setting to make it right. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so oh. every, everybody's a southpaw in this oh, modern age. That became a song. Um, even Bob Ross gets the blues. Bob Ross like I don't really blues. know where this comes from. That's a great one though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I find that too with like writing or you know even my podcast or anything on you know, my blog, whether it's my blog or it's journalism stuff. I mean, you know, I'm always sending myself notes or taking notes and I need to do it more. I probably should do it more than I do, but it's, I, there's like gold nuggets that happen mm -hmm. in your thought process. And I feel like oftentimes they just slide to the abyss if you don't capture yeah. them or maybe if they're real good, they stick to you for, yeah. You know. Yeah. There was this one time, uh, I was in inner sleeve records here and I was talking, this is like 20 years ago. And I was talking to this, this lady and she was talking about how many members of her family had cancer. And she just looked at me at one point and just said, there's no answer for cancer. And I was like, damn dude. <laughs> like, that's right, no, I'm saving that's that a headline later. right there. Yeah. No answer for cancer. Yeah, I'm saving that for later. I mean, yeah. it sounds so cliche, like simple and cliched. And yet it's like something about the way she said it like just really, really stuck with me. You know? Oh yeah, and I mean, it's, that's a true fact. Too. Now is your process, is your process differ from when you were writing for Porsches and Hand Grenades versus uh, your solo stuff? Yes and no. So like, Horseshoes has some, any anytime you play with mm -hmm. others. Yeah. You know, there's your personal limitations. There's mm -hmm. what what you have, like. There's your capabilities as an individual. Like, mm -hmm. how big is your vocal range? You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know things like that. Yeah. And then when you add other humans to the mix, there's more of those. Um, um, you know, kind of guidelines. Like, I tend to write to people's talents when I'm thinking about a song being a horseshoe song, 
you know, like for instance, some keys are easier for a fiddle to play in. Some keys oh, sound better on a har harmonica than others. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's things like that that you can play to you. Recently in making these solo albums, it's a little easier for me to sing most of these songs, the new ones, because huh. I've solely selected the key based upon my voice. All right. So that's actually been really nice. It's like you know, sometimes with, mm -hmm. with horseshoe songs, I have to like warm up my voice a lot before yeah. some of these shows because they're the key's high. A, the key is a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm a baritone singer and mm -hmm. in horseshoes I sing a lot of tenor. Which is funny because because now like I can do it, you know, mm -hmm. at home, but it's like it hurts a little. So I did notice the uh, yeah, your voice did seem to be deeper on, on your solo stuff. Yeah. Than, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize that was a really, like specific key selection that you know, okay, I'm gonna sing it in this key because it's easier. Definitely a choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely a choice. And yeah, so I mean things like that, but as in terms of the actual writing process. Not really. I mean, I think there's there's some songs that kind of fit a band like Horseshoes, like Ethos. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there's a vibe. And I know what songs fit that vibe and what do not. Um, and, you know. And what went into the decision to start doing solo stuff? And then how do you, how do you approach that? Because I could see, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't like let your band know ahead of time, like, hey, this is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, they might be a little, they might wonder like, oh, wait a minute, is he going off on his own now? Or Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it's not really like that. Like okay. everybody has other things going on mm -hmm. in life. You know, um, Colin, while we were on tour, became a lawyer. Oh, you know? wow. So he's, he practices law. Wow. <laughs> yeah um dave has always loved doing food things you know mm -hmm. so he works as a chef too um sam opened up an organic farm wow that him and his girlfriend and some of their friends operate that seems fitting for a bluegrass band lawyers a little outside of the branding <laughs> But, yeah. I, but I like it. That's cool. I know. It, it I almost, have a lot of respect for that. It, it yeah. isn't, it isn't. In a yeah. way, it makes sense. But, mm -hmm. but uh, and then Russ, you know, recently had his first kid. Wow. So, Congrats, uh, Russ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, he, he like, got married. And, and, you know, so, and he actually just got, like, a, a good, a really good job, too. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, Horseshoes is still a band, but you know, five years ago, we were playing 150 shows a year. Yeah. You know? And that's not what we're going to be doing anymore. So it's, huh. it's more like, you know, I could see Horseshoes playing 75 shows a year, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, if even. You know? Yeah. No, I, well, one of the things I think a lot of people might not realize is that you guys live like all over the Midwest. Right? All over. Like Minnesota yeah. and different parts of Wisconsin. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that, you know, presents its own innate challenges. Like I remember when that happened, it's like, well, mm -hmm. we can't, we can't all just decide where we're all going to live together. That's like, yeah, right. Yeah. That's pretty weird. You know, <laughs> like that's, it's hard enough to do that with your partner. Yeah, I know. The, I guess the dead did that when when they were first starting out in California. They yeah, had a house. house they did. And we did that, area. too. I mean, yeah, yeah. we all lived in the same house at Stevens Point for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But Was that in your college days when you guys yeah, started? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we could, Colin was living in Milwaukee while he was going to law school. And mm -hmm. Things just started to disperse. But, oh, the moral of the story is mm -hmm. horseshoes with these other various uh life components to various members has to slow down play mm -hmm. less and i don't have a law practice i don't mm -hmm. have a f another full-time job I'm not doing an organic farm so mm -hmm. and i want my life to continue to be music so it's a natural thing and i think everybody gets that yeah okay so there, there didn't need to be much of a conversation that was kind of understood not really i think it's pretty Mm -hmm. pretty clear i mean you try to so i feel like course, you try to communicate yeah, it, i feel like your situation isn't what most people picture when they think of a band like 
they kind of think of the band as like this guys all on this tour bus together roaming around and then mm-hmm. and then going to the studio when they're done yeah um, but that's not, that's not how it works for you guys and, and it's, that's and really, it's interesting really that. that's sort of a fiction for the is it really yeah industry i mean a lot of people have very normal lives mm-hmm. you know kids family go home and you know do normal life family things and then you go out on the road again and you know uh yeah there's a lot of the perception of the music industry is oftentimes quite a bit different than the reality Mm -hmm. of the music industry it's like one um meme meme is that how you say it i think so yeah. yeah that i found funny was like the what people think a green room is Oh. It's like this, like awesome looking party. Oh, really? Yeah. And then, uh, like, what is what the green room actually is? And it's like five dudes on their cell phones, like, yeah, right. <laughs> which is totally what it actually is. <laughs> yeah, well, we, um, I always got a kick out of the, So we used to, we used to record, and sometimes I still do record the podcast in the, in the green room at, at Whitewater. Uh, Whitewater. Yeah, yeah. And it actually is green. Yeah. So how many of them are actually green? <laughs> Uh, well, it depends on your definition of green. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Ours used to be a real green. Yeah, nice. Not, nice. not so much anymore. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get older. Like, I just t- turned 30, mm-hmm. and I'm the second youngest in the band. Sam turns 30 in November. Oh, wow. And so, I mean, you know, like, it, it, you always used to hear, like, well, right around 30, a lot of life changes start happening. And, uh, you know, when when you're, when you're 20, you're like, ah, but then when you get there, you're like, huh, I kind of know what they mean. You know? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't slow down. Yeah. Like you kind of got there earlier. You just didn't realize it. Yeah. But then there's other things that I was like, well, you know, especially, uh, I know, I remember when I was a kid, 30 was always seen as like, you'd see, you know, it was like a theme on sitcoms, like, oh, I'm turning 30. I'm old now. I was like 30. I'm like, I don't know. Just, everything still works. You yeah. Know? Might, might yeah. Be, might, might not like staying out as late and getting up. Or, that's just, you know, that's getting, one big one for me yeah. is like the love of comforts. Like I'm going right. to do this, this like uh, virtual show mm-hmm. in Eau Claire today. And usually I would have packed my bedroll and a tent or slept in the back of my car. And this time I'm like, no, I think I'll just like drink like two beers in a couple hours over there. And, stay good to drive and mm. boogie back to steven's point sleep in my own bed yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's weird i know this quarantine time like a lot of bands that were hitting it super hard have been for years mm-hmm. it dawned on a lot of those bands like oh my gosh maybe we should just chill out yeah it's nice to be at home right <laughs> you know and i yeah. definitely have that going on I, I love central wisconsin i love living mm-hmm. here um been really enjoying fishing and just connecting with neighbors and yeah waking up and making a good breakfast mm-hmm. and right staying a little more healthy and like things like that mm-hmm. you know? so a lot of silver linings getting sure. out on the on the fly street and the on the streams yeah, as much as fishing. humanly yeah. possible pretty much every day you know mm-hmm. and I admittedly i almost get a little cranky when i'm not when i don't mm-hmm. get to get out there you know because it's such a good outlet like yeah the world especially right now with you know the news being as depressing as it is and social Mm -hmm. media being so taxing it's like giving yourself some time to unplug and only worry about your fly drifting appropriately down right for a trout to eat it yeah like that's why fly fishing for me is so awesome Mm -hmm. it requires enough of you to like black out in the other yeah it takes your attention it really your takes attention. Your, attention. your attention exactly it doesn't you know, allow you to like drift and concern yourself mm-hmm. with often fictitious concerns you know that we, that we allow to weigh ourselves down now are you the kind of fisherman like you get mad if you don't catch fish or are you like just happy to be out there or some mix of the two uh, some mix of the two but mm-hmm. more happy to be out there i mean i fish really hard and really? so like you know it, 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 there was a what does run. that mean what does that mean if you fish hard like i take it pretty seriously yeah. i always have yeah. since i was young i love fishing you like, tie your own flies 
I don't. No, I don't. And I feel like that's another activity that could really focus your attention and kind of, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? I don't know why I have it. Like people ask that all the time. And I like, really? frankly, just haven't had interest. In it. Mm-hmm. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Plenty of people, like most yeah. intense fly fishermen do, you know, yeah, I guess they, they do. Yeah. They get super into it. And I just never have. Mm-hmm. I also have like four really good buddies who are really good at oh, it. Yeah, and, yeah. So that's almost impeded my need. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, it's not it's not all about catching fish yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, it's definitely more about the activity because, mm-hmm. you know, the reason I love fly fishing so much, and this is somewhat true for your typical mm-hmm. conventional spin casting, but fly fishing is like, it's so um, uh, gratifying for you to like get like a perfect cast with a perfect drift. Well, I mean, even feels. if a fish doesn't eat, mm-hmm. it's just still so engaging and, and you know. It is, it's different than regular fishing. It really is. It says, yeah, there is something really satisfying when you get, when you get it to just lay out perfectly, like it just It's like, ah. Out. Yeah, it's like, ah. Maybe like you feel accomplished. It's like mini accomplishment. It's just, it's just a very satisfying feeling. Right. right? Yeah, right. so you're reminding me, like, I really should be getting back into fly fishing. I don't know what's wrong. A lot with of me. good water around here. It's a good man. time to do it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the, the pandemic, you know, I, I read somewhere that, like, they've sold over, like, 10,000 10, additional licenses wow. in the state. Wow. And, you know, I can tell you mm-hmm. for sure that I'm seeing more people than I ever have. Oh, yeah. I bet. But the thing that I worry about is, it's not like bag limits are adjusted. Exactly. Right. You know, like people can still, you know, let's say that previously it was two thirds of people or it would be less than that, but like one fourth of people keep their limit of trout every time they go. Mm-hmm. The numbers increase, the number of trout you're pulling out. Yeah, too, yeah. I'm freaked out about that. Like I hope it doesn't like wreck the quarry, but right. you know, I mean, you, oh, that is scary. Rules are, you know, it's it's like that's why there should be like flexibility with these kinds of things. But of course, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh. Do you keep a lot of a lot of fish that you catch? Are you, you a catch and release guy? Or? I don't keep a single one. No, you're just catch, catch, and, catch release. and release. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I guess I would, if I was out fishing walleyes, mm-hmm. I would maybe keep a legal walleye to eat. But I can't kill it. trout. Are like spiritual, really cool little mm-hmm. creatures. I don't know. Unless I hooked one poorly and I th- thought it was going to die, then mm-hmm. I'd maybe keep it. And honestly, I'd probably keep it if it was legal or not. If I was going to kill it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like you know. yeah. Every once in a while, they just could hooked in that way. That's you know, right. They're not going to survive. But right. Yeah, I never really was into keeping fish. I always just wanted to throw them back. My dad used to get kind of mad about that, but. Like, they, I, like I was like I don't I was like I can get better fish at the store like I'm not right. I, don't, I didn't really like the cleaning part no I didn't enjoy that at all no I mean for me it's just mostly like I don't know it's especially a trout thing it's just like mm-hmm. there's such a you, know, you feel I feel such a close connection with them like it drives me nuts to see them like mishandled like I'm pretty intense about it like Mm-hmm. I have fished with like gear like um spinners or like Rapalas. You gotta remember that's like six hooks on a Rapala. Right. Yeah. And they're like it doesn't like I've killed fish for sure because mm-hmm. of like just hooks being everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that's really what got me back into fly fishing was like mm-hmm. having a episode of like feeling like I mangled a fish from mm-hmm. using a Rapala. Yeah. Like you can catch a lot of really awesome trout on those but i don't know it just kind of makes me uh you know uncomfortable for the safety of the fish that's good i mean you got the you got the ethics down, down then yeah that's man important. barb no barb and mm-hmm. single hook and yeah I, I don't know it's crazy like wisconsin's a little behind the curve in that world like you go to wyoming you go to colorado you go to montana those are all the rules interesting so literally the rules but of course you know wisconsin you know mm-hmm. does great with following rules or <laughs> suggestions clearly as this pandemic has yeah right <laughs> yeah that's crazy i'm sure we really want to talk about that yeah right 
Well, it is, it is, I, I am really interested in it from the musical angle because I feel bad like for a lot of bands, like, uh, like the guy who was doing the production on my podcast before, like, you know, he was, his two ways of making money were his band, the sub style, mm-hmm. and it was, you know, t- teaching guitar lessons. And, you know, both of those pretty much dried up because yeah, of the pandemic. So he's definitely. like, well, now what do I do? And uh, he's found some, you know, some of his, some of his clients would do, they, they were okay with doing video lessons. And then a, a few of them that didn't in the beginning were like, okay, I think this is going to last a while. So yeah, let's go back to doing, you know, making video conference with my kid and teaching yeah. that way. Yeah. And he's been doing some recording work too to help pay the bills. I mean, recording is, is sort of one approach that I've taken. Oh, really? And I mean, I, I love doing the recording mm-hmm. thing. You have a home studio? Yeah. That's it's, cool. I mean, it's pretty makeshift. I feel like you can set that up easy and kind of got the brain. You can have a good computer and have the brains of it on You definitely and, can. You know, you got Pro Tools or whatever. Yeah, like I mean, it's kind of the future yeah. in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. It costs a lot of money to go in and cut records. Yeah. You know, like Quarantine Tangerine, like, most people think that sounds great. I think it was done great. Right, right in my house. Yeah, I would never like, know that. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. you can get away with it, and uh, and why wouldn't you? I mean, there's something really romantic about going to a cool recording studio mm-hmm. that has good energy, like a pachyderm where, like, horseshoes mm-hmm. cuts. And, right. You know, and doing that whole thing. But, I mean, if it's not in the budget, like, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, like, gigs dry up that means managers booking agents bands crew Mm -hmm. nobody's getting paid right and you know i mean bands that are like basically our size and bigger could apply for the ppp oh yeah i suppose protection program like anybody at you know like uh any other business and we did and we got it Mm -hmm. so that's good and that's helped us Mm -hmm. um immensely but i think the the big anxiety is really like how long is could this go on here mm, right like i mean are we talking you know into 2021 which if i had to guess is probably the case well the hard part about it isn't there isn't a hard line there isn't a like you know on june 26th still pandemic you know june 27th everything's back to normal like it's right. it's like this fuzzy gray area where things will slowly start shifting towards back towards normal i don't know if they ever get normal normal you know, yeah you know amorphous I mean? is that the word it could be yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. right yeah what is it going to look like a year from now you know i don't think it looks like it did a year ago um i think it'll look i think it'll things will be better than they are now and things will be more opened up but i feel like a lot of those a lot of the changes you know some of them are probably for the good like you know a lot more people are working from home and i think that probably is good for saving transportation costs mm, and, you know the environment in general environment in general yeah, yeah. I think that's a good thing but yeah it, you know live music i feel like i feel like that's going to be one of the casualties i feel like that's going to be one of the later things to come back and that's unfortunate i think you're probably right i mean i remember mm-hmm. thinking like in april these like festivals are canceling and rescheduling for august and i'm mm-hmm. just like we'll see Right on. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that'll go. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I I don't honestly think it will. But. How do you feel about all this live streaming stuff now? Because like a lot of bands kind of turn to that towards doing live stream shows. And how, how do you feel about that? Um, Obviously, you're on your way to do one today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I right at the beginning, right when I started Quarantine Tangerine, I mean, I mm-hmm. I went down. I won't call it a doomsday hole, but pretty mm-hmm. immediately, like March 11th or whatever. I was like, this is going to be a long time. I need mm-hmm. to like set some structure in my life. And so started pounding out that album, mm-hmm. um, which was just good to like occupy my brain, you know, Yeah. Uh, a project. And then the other thing I did was start a Monday night, Monday night live series. So I went live every mm-hmm. single Monday night for 10 weeks straight. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. I played for like two hours every Monday. That's awesome. And like people ended up following it. And it was like a really good vibe. I really, mm-hmm. I really, really enjoyed doing it. Um, and there was like a couple other, you know, it became so hip that various other offers were coming in to do live streaming things. Mm-hmm. 
And towards the end of that time period, I started to like not appreciate it very much. Hmm. You know, it was like at the beginning, it was kind of cool and kind of novelty. And I felt like I was, you know, maybe helping some folks get Mm -hmm. through an anxious time, Yeah, which felt good. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like anytime you can help somebody, especially in a time like this, like if I can help somebody have less anxiety, awesome. Yeah. Um, but then as it went on, like it got almost, uh, flooded, you know, so many mm-hmm. different bands were doing it and it was like, right. You know, how, you know, you can't sit there and watch live streams all day from your house. Shouldn't probably. Yeah. That's what I noticed. There was a couple of times I was, I was thinking, but one of them wasn't a, it wasn't a band, but it was like a, it was like a Friday and someone wanted to have a zoom dance party. And my first thought was, oh, oh, cool, I'll do this with my friends. And then, you know, Friday night comes along and it's like, I've just been on my computer all day. I don't want to be on my computer again. I, know. I was like, oh, heck with it. And I didn't join it. I felt kind of bad because they were my friends. But I was yeah. like, dude, I can't be on it. I got to get away from the computer. That's 100% what happened to me yeah. by the end of this. So then, mm-hmm. like, the it was right before the 10th the one. And I didn't really plan to stop after 10. But it was, like, the week before that. I was like, I can't. You know, and of course, social media was such a and still is such a energetic suck. Like it's got its, mm-hmm. it's got its awesome points in connecting people, but man, it's too much of that is not a good thing. I agree. And, and I was like having to be involved with it more than I wanted to be. So I just announced that it was the last one. And then as offers came in to do other ones, I just explained that I needed more time in nature and less time mm-hmm. on myself. Out. And thank you yeah. for the offer. And, you know, and then like, you know, there's entities that you have a long standing relationships with where, you know, it's not that you owe them anything or that mm-hmm. they owe you anything, but you've, you know, scratched each other's backs for a long yeah. time. And like, like one of those would be Blue Ox, you know, like, mm-hmm. of course, I'm happy to go drive over there. And like, that's different too. Like that's going there and like, it's all probably will feel somewhat like a show. It's not just being at your home on your cell phone. Right. Yeah. Same in the same mm-hmm. corner of my upstairs room. So yeah, you know, I, I overall feel pretty good about it. Mm-hmm. It's really odd to, to, I guess I didn't realize how much of the performance circle or like the the energetic um, cycle that happens in live music. I didn't realize how much of that is based off of like nonverbal communication, like the way that we look at each other, oh, yeah. like the, the yeah. smile, a nod. Mm-hmm. So like initially when I was doing those, it was like the lack of feedback was like sort of peculiar. Yeah, it's got to be weird to get to the end of a song and it's just silent. Yeah. Like, uh, did you, did, have you heard of Gem Productions and the live yeah. things they're doing? Like, they're pretty yeah. impressive. Like, they got yeah. the whole lights and sound. And I, I watched, I watched Substyles because my producer was in it. And uh, it sounded great, except for a couple things. You know, one, for some reason, the ghost notes didn't come through. So it sounded like it just had sort of a odd quality oh, to it. Oh, because it was all direct feeded. Yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't have like room noises. Yeah, there's no room noises. Yeah. Which is weird. And then it um and then like, you know, when they get done, it's just silence. And you're like, that's so weird. It's so awkward. It's like you just feel like I feel like I feel like especially with this, <laughs> they should have like some kind of clap track or something yeah. just to make it feel Yeah, I um started like developing like a nervous like sort of tick after I'd play a song. <laughs> like the song and I'd be like <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> right on and then would like play the next song like almost every song You're like i'm just imagining you guys clapping. yeah it's just <laughs> so weird you know you don't know how to how to react but you know overall you know it's it's cool to see people getting creative mm-hmm. you know i mean we have to difficult times call for you know some difficult measures and if we yeah. can still create a, a a platform for live music even if there's a little mm-hmm. awkward components like that uh that's a good thing and so you know ultimately i i think it's positive going back to the album like you know what did you do for bringing in other musicians on it that's not all you right mm-hmm. yeah so uh 
when the project started, mm -hmm. I thought of, I was thinking of it as a simple project, maybe just me and I would maybe lay down all the instruments. I, mm -hmm. you know, I play keys, play bass. Uh, basically I could play stringed instruments, but I don't play drums. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, I could just do it that way. But then like, you know, in texting with friends, realized, you know, there's people who are bored or like wanting to do music or, um, you know, or something. Oh, I'd been listening to a lot of Jason Isabel, mm -hmm. who I love and like was really enjoying the way that he was putting together, uh, putting music behind his songs. Like, and I, I realized I wanted drums. So I hit up, um, Tyler and Jeff from Fruition. They're the rhythm section for Fruition. They're, Christian's a great band that started out in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, cool. And uh, they were both elated to want to play because they wanted some work, you know, and mm -hmm. had too much free time. And and so they uh, they laid down bass and drums on several tracks. And then I hit up Kenny Leiser, who's Wheelhouse's fiddle player. He plays down at Malarkey's a lot, actually. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, uh, I asked him to to essentially lay down a symphony from home on several of the tracks. So that's where you hear that. Did, yeah, it's, it's awesome, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, he did all those parts. I don't know, like, yeah, it's just how his brain works, I guess. Wow. And I, uh, <laughs> I know, right? I, I, it's a joy to work with him. <laughs> and Dan Kimball from down in uh, Milwaukee, he's like uh, kind of a freelance pedal steel player. Huh love working with him he's got great ideas and asked him and then there was this tune wildlands that sort of became the single and uh i realized it called for dobro and banjo so i hit up mm -hmm. andy and andy andy from leftover sand and salmon and andy from uh infamous string dusters and they crushed it so they all these people just recorded from home Mm -hmm. You know, like, and that's partially why I selected them was their ability to do so. Yeah, so I was going to ask, like, how, so you, none of them came to your home studio? They just no. All, they just all recorded on there? No, I mean, those, those guys live in, so it's Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Madison, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Portland, Denver, and Denver. Yeah. So, or Denver and, like, the mountains above Boulder, actually. How does that work? You send them the track, they put it on their Pro Tools and or whatever they got in Logic or whatever they're using, play it, and then send it back to you? Yeah, like, I mean, there can be a little bit of difficulty there. Mm -hmm. I actually, believe it or not, do all of my recording through a Boss BR600 digital recorder. Really? It's like a early 2000s. It's like basically retro at this point. <laughs> um, and uh, so they have to send me like a 16-bit um 44.1 track and i upload it through a huh. computer into my little digital recorder and i mixed and mastered that whole album too wow yeah it's like from this digital recorder and an old mixing board that's amazing because it sounds great that's awesome like recording is so far beyond my understanding right now like i was watching um because harold was using our studio for his recording studio too and he was showing me like the grid and all the parts he's putting in i'm just looking at this thing like oh my god i wouldn't know where to start i do like fiddling around with that stuff though like i've been fiddling around with video editing stuff it's more now. intuitive than you think yeah. and I, I feel like once you get going on it you're good to go and i mean there's a lot of little stuff like compression is really important in recording mm -hmm. yeah how much reverb you use yeah but just learning how to get a better sound with this thing like when i first got it i was like wow this thing doesn't sound that good yeah and i just realized it's because well i had the gain really cranked way up and i can turn that down and uh, i learned a lot working with harold that was great having him on the podcast for a while because i just learned a lot about how to do how to do some of this stuff better and you know not there's a learning stuff. curve there's a learning curve yeah. yeah no i know man it's uh thankfully i got that back in like i said early 2000s and like mm -hmm. started working on it right away and sort of had a base level of knowledge to go going into this quarantine tangerine thing and i mean i'm working on another one right now like me and um charlie barons from the manitowoc minute yeah that was super interested in that tell him, me how that all, all came about uh we're just good buddies mm -hmm. 
And uh, yeah, we're actually recording an entire album right now called Barons and Gruel. Didn't you? Through? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Did you tell me you guys met on the road? Is that how that worked? Yeah, we had met. I I had somehow seen that he like listened to Horseshoes or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he like posted something maybe about Wisconsin waters. Well, long story short, unbeknownst to me, he's always kind of been in, like he liked the Grateful Dead. He was actually briefly in a Grateful Dead cover band. No, no so, kidding. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So him and his cousin, Tommy, both really like bluegrass. So mm-hmm. they have been like listening to us. And I maybe got wind of that, or maybe it was just a coincidence. I can't really remember. And I shot him a message and just said like, Hey, you know, let us know if you want to do like, I think I asked if he was around in Milwaukee and wanted to MC New Year's. Oh, yeah. He's like, no, but we should connect, you know, yada, yada, yada. He popped in the recording studio after a show in Minneapolis. We were down at Pachyderm. And him and I kind of hit it off. And then we ended up down in Nashville at the same time. Partied a bunch. Mm-hmm. Bar hopped. And, uh, Summer in there started writing a song, the old Wisconsin Jubilee. Yeah. And we were like, well, shit, let's go to the recording studio. So we <laughs> went to bed and woke up early, went and got a case of beer, went to the recording studio <laughs> and started uh, old Wisconsin Jubilee. And that was the beginning of it all. Nice. But since then, him and I really, mm-hmm. you know, we really just became uh, mostly just good buddies. He's That's cool. super, super nice dude. And, um, yeah, you know, we have sort of the same. We have a similar sense of humor, you know? Uh, so like, for, for instance, he was actually up here. We, went, we were out fishing a couple of days ago here. Oh, and, nice. Uh, yeah, we're just working on all these songs and it's fun working with him. He's, he's such a creative fella, but he also works really well with others. So like yeah. we record, we uh, uh, wrote a tune, like probably it was only an hour and a half. We were just like sitting there. I was just like, messing around on my guitar <laughs> on a couch and he's just like pacing around the room talking and i'm like chipping back at him next thing you know, the song was done and uh yeah so i'm excited to see where that all comes it's probably gonna be an ep maybe like a seven song something like that but that's all getting done on the digital recorder too nice is that a is that a humorous song is, is it taking a humorous route or are you guys doing serious stuff how's that work because that's kind of his thing like you know it's I mean, it actually is like a stand-up comic, right? Yeah. 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 You know, uh, I'm looking at, at what we're – I mean, I think it's pretty funny myself. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, this one, it's like the Supper Club Shuffle. Yeah. <laughs> Church got out. It's just past noon. Got to do something between now and two. Want to get huh. lit up and say it more subtle. How's about we do the Supper Club Shuffle? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, right. it's not like stuff that'll just make you like, like go geek, fall geek out <laughs> yeah, necessarily, right. but it's, it's stuff <laughs> that's like clever and fits the, yeah. fits the mold. It's not that's just awesome. Wisconsin based either. Like old Wisconsin okay. Jubilee was, um, mm-hmm. what's the other one we're working on? Oh, naming your towns is the name of this one tune. It's all about mm-hmm. like the goofy name towns, like knock em stiff, Ohio. <laughs> in like disco wisconsin and stuff like that so that's fantastic got some cool some mm-hmm. cool stuff up our sleeves and yeah it's fun working with him he um he does a little bit of playing and singing in his shows typically oh that's cool i've never yeah. seen one of his shows i, I watch his youtube channel it's, a lot, but it's so so funny i gotta go see one of those it's so good but uh oh he in this process has also been like just further developing his singing voice and he's actually got like a great natural voice too so yeah that's something i actually i wanted to ask you ask you about like how did you develop your singing voice and how did it develop over the years well i'm not a uh like an an especially trained or learned singer Mm -hmm. myself um you know i still can like barely read music I did choir and stuff like that growing up. Never got voice lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, Did some self-learning. I used to, one big change for me is in in the early horseshoes days, I smoked a ton of reefer. (laughs) And in that, like, can have pretty awful effects on your vocal range. A lot of musicians talk about 
when, when you stop smoking or you figure your vocal range mm-hmm. opens up and that's definitely the case for me no question oh. but i mean i'll say that like initially in early horseshoes days i was not a confident singer mm-hmm. i i could sing and was capable but mm-hmm. um you know i was often concerned about pitch and i was definitely more pitchy then than you know i can still be pitchy these days you felt like it's a long process developing your vocals like it's an ongoing thing i mean i think it was for me so i interviewed one of my other friends who's been a musician for a long time and he said yeah we were talking about confidence in vocals yeah he he said he said it was like would have been about five years ago that he finally felt like he was maybe six or seven years ago you know, and he's about my age, um, like 40. I didn't notice um, a definitive point myself. Before he was finally felt confident in his own vocals. And that just amazed me because he had been in like three bands by that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. I probably appeared to be confident in mm-hmm. my vocals, but that really, I mean, that, these days I feel great about it. But I'm yeah. also, I feel a lot of it kind of has to do with like your health too. Like, Interesting. if you're staying hydrated and you're taking care of yourself, your body's going to feel good. You're going to be able to, like, you're going to be able to sing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, do you smoke? Like, not just reefer, but, like, you know, cigarettes. Like, your lung mm-hmm. capacity is a big part of it. Oh, yeah. Um, and did you feel like, did you feel like you always had a, to me, you have a very bluegrass sounding voice. Like, yeah. Did you, did do you, you feel, feel, do you think that on the recent records too? I did, yeah. Okay. Because, like, some people said that my voice sounded different on the new stuff. Huh. And I kind of know what they mean to some degree. Uh, I still think it sounds very bluegrass. I don't. Okay. I guess I hadn't compared the two. I'd have to go back and listen to both of them. But yeah, I don't know. It's not with intent. I'll tell you that much. The voice is just, it just is what it is. Good. Like, it, it, it feels good to sing it that way or to sing how I sing. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to be a chameleon vocally when I sing with other people, because to some degree, that's what makes you a good harmony singer is your, your ability to recognize the tonal qualities of somebody's voice. That's a topic. So that's a topic I'm really interested in. Like the idea of like, cause I feel like I do that with my voice and like, I know at some point, singers develop their own voice and like yeah. where does that come from that's what I always yeah wonder. yeah where does developing your own voice come from and i've started to feel like recently when i sing that i'm starting to sound more like me and less like other people and that took a long yeah. time and it's still you know little bits and bits and pieces man, i don't you know? know what that's about yeah but i know exactly what you're talking about mm-hmm. i mean i think it's natural like i mean as a writer for instance like you learn from something you take on Mm -hmm. qualities that you've read in the past like Mm -hmm. almost nothing we do as humans is like truly original like it's all the product of you having like learned from other people Mm -hmm. even dylan will say that sure like he said that in his famous speech when he got whatever award recently that Mm -hmm. that like you know people are like so treat him as like mystical but he's like, no, nah, I just like stole these old songs and put my own understanding. Well, you know, it's funny. I was watching a documentary about him and they interviewed someone who grew up with him in Minnesota. And they said, yeah, he was like, he was like a pretty average singer, nothing special. And then he went to the village, went and lived in the village and was playing. And then he came back and all of a sudden he was Bob Dylan, basically. Yeah. So he took all those influences yeah. from seeing other people play and they all blended together. And what's interesting now is you don't have to go to the village. You can turn on YouTube or you can, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like you can get all these influences and yeah. all this, you can learn these different styles. You can probably learn a lot of times from the musician. Like I've been practicing slide guitar and I've like found cool. some really good slide players yeah. to learn from. And you're just like, oh, here's how Roosevelt he Collier. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I wonder if finding your own voice doesn't have to do with finding and embracing the influences that speak to you right and you know maybe your voice is the mm-hmm. juxtaposition of the 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 artists and that that you most appreciate it and that and that are yeah. like part of i think a lot about like the these um the continuation of energy mm-hmm. yeah like 
for instance, Colonel Bruce Hampton, mm-hmm. Vince Herman is a huge, like his big inspiration is Colonel Bruce Hampton, Vince Herman from Leftover Salmon. Vince Herman from Leftover Salmon is like a big influence on me. It's like mm-hmm. this like energetic transfer in time. Like, you know, things don't really die, they just change. So it's interesting to think about that in regards to finding your voice. Like, yeah. like your voice is almost the voice of mm-hmm. energy of old. It's like this lineage coming through that keeps you. Yeah. Down and then as you change it a little bit, the, you know, the next person changes it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and, and then that maybe becomes quote unquote your own, even though it's really all of these energies mm-hmm. melding into you and, and undoubtedly then being passed on to others. It's interesting because I feel like with writing, I feel like my own voice came out pretty quickly and it's always developing, but I felt like that happened faster. But with music, probably because I write every, you know, I've been writing every day for God knows how long. It's just like what I do. Whereas, you know, music, I haven't been as voracious. I have during the quarantine now. Have you? I really jumped back into like writing, even writing music and playing other music, learning new techniques and, yeah, um, Harold helped a lot with that too because he would give me ideas, and then I would go home and be like, "Oh yeah," you know. This idea of doing less less instead of more on guitar was really interesting to me. You know, he was saying one of the exercises he was he was like, suggesting to me is like just take a song that you like and um, try to try to fit a guitar part into it and don't hammer it over the top, but it, like fit it in there. Yeah, you know, be minimal. Think yeah. about what I can do that just fits that song without. And I was like, shit, that's great. It's a good exercise. It's a really good exercise. Yeah, another good one is uh, mm-hmm. is putting a simple chord progress, like playing a, trying to play a song that you don't mm-hmm. know and just giving it the simplest chord progression oh, yeah. possible. Yeah, he, he, talk, he was telling me Simplicity about is the real, you know, it's important. Yeah, it's like coming back full circle to the... Um, you know, starting off with simplicity, then you get more and more complex, and then as you master things, you go back to simplicity. Yeah. But now you've gone the whole circle, so yeah, at that mastery stage. Yeah, I know. Like the next record, or maybe not the next record, but sometime mm-hmm. soon, I plan on just doing vocals, guitar, the whole record. You know, nice. Partially for that simplicity. So know? I'm keeping an eye on the time for you, so I won't. Yeah. I think we're pretty close, but I just want to see if anyone had. Uh, I asked people online if on Facebook if they had any questions. Oh, yeah, cool. And uh, of course, now it's taken like three million years to pull. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, it's, Facebook has gotten really slow lately. Yeah, but like everybody's chilling. Yeah, really like everyone's on Facebook. Oh, we got a couple. Let's see what they ask. Okay. Oh, that's an, one said no questions, but excited to listen. That's cool. <laughs> What about political questions and what's happening now? How does that affect their music? Hey, that's a good one. Sure. I was, yeah, you know, I was just thinking about that on the way over. Like, you know, this idea of writing writing stuff that's topical versus timeless. And then I think I was thinking about stuff from the 60s that I love listening to that, you know, the Vietnam War has been over for 50 years. Um, but I still love those songs. So sometimes I think those topical things can transcend the um, the time that they're in but maybe you, so i wonder what you think about that you know obviously the quarantine tangerine that's that's named very very timely to what's going on now but how do what do you think about that when you write music like the timeliness versus uh or timelessness versus uh writing about what's going on right now and i mean i you don't really think about that i don't want to concern myself with with what you know people will think about this you know uh or, you know, that's, uh, to me, that's pretty arrogant to think that a song will, like, will last the, you know, the, uh, it'll it'll last for time, you know, like, people will give a shit about this 25 <laughs> years from now. I mean, do I, of course, I hope that, I that, yeah. that, that people would, mm-hmm. that, it, that it would affect people in a positive way. But what came to mind was, I just wrote a tune called Call It What It Is, mm-hmm. um, which is about the George Floyd stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that song, I did not put George, I, this, this, it's an intro, this relates to the question quite a bit, actually, yeah. but um, I didn't put George Floyd's name in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that, like, 
with the awareness that like, you know, people are, there's the, like the hashtag, say his, say his name, say, you know, mm-hmm. and I know that, mm-hmm. but I also am aware that George Floyd is just like one of many humans this happened to and right. may have roughly the same thing may happen again in time, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like the, I was not specific deliberately. Mm, right. And I wondered if that would be critiqued by anybody and no, that hasn't actually occurred. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's politics are an interesting thing to, to, um, uh, to sort of critique in music. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing that I've noticed is like, call it what it is. If you, read the lyrics to me mm-hmm. i'm very obviously pro protests i'm like yeah. very in, in my mm-hmm. opinion like it's very clear that that's what i'm saying right and like it's i'm i think it's very clear that i'm saying like things need to change like mm-hmm. i'm not saying that like all police officers are bad or any shit like that mm-hmm. right but i i think that it's pretty clear the perspective that i'm coming from when i read the lyrics What I've noticed is that like people have this self-confirming, like I think there's like a a psychology term for it. Cognitive dissonance? Like the self-confirming bias maybe is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Where like you see a piece of art or you see a poster and you think it's confirming your beliefs. Yeah, you see a confirmation bias. Because like like, there's people who I know like completely disagree with me on the political scale but we're like reposting, call it what it is. And like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And it's mm-hmm. like the, the post before that's like complaining about protesters. <laughs> and you're crazy. just like, huh, what is going on? <laughs> and I've had that happen yeah. before. Like there's a song I'll never forget. And, you know, so, I mean, I'm happy to say it. Like basically I'm, I'm historically like I'm for, I'm, I'm not at all Mm anti-immigrants like i believe in uh like public health care i think Mm -hmm. i think you know getting closer to to income uh equality i think that that would help to cure a bunch of these problems like racism Mm -hmm. you know and some of these systemic issues i think if we had universal health care i think that would help to to deal with some of these problems that we face um you know, as a country. Um, but there's this song that I wrote called the Republicratic Convention. Republicratic Convention. Yeah. And That's it great. was written going into the, it must have, it must have been the Hillary Trump mm-hmm. time period. And we were playing down in um, Bristol, Tennessee. If you know Bristol, it's half of it's in Virginia, half of it's in Tennessee. It's okay. over there. So it's pretty conservative country. Mm-hmm. And uh, knowing that, put out Republicratic Convention. And the lyrics, so like, if you remember that time period, it was really all about the wall. Like the wall was the big discussion. Oh, I the wall, yeah. The stupid mm-hmm. wall. <laughs> like, Jesus. which now you look back at and you're just like, the emails, the wall, are you kidding me? You know, it's just like so frustrating. <laughs> Um, but I, the lyrics are, if ever a time, it's always the time to gather together what walls can't divide, conquer the darkness with a barrel of light, like a gun line, yeah, yeah. uh, blue, red, and green, brown, black, and white. So like, it, you know, I don't know. To me, it's pretty clearly saying something. And how did that go over? awesome (laughs) awesome and like and to take this conversation full circle Mm self-confirming bias i noticed in a group of older women in the front Mm -hmm. that were rocking like trump shirts and like shit like that yeah the mega hat in there i think that's maybe what it was it might have been the mega hat (laughs) something like that where it was like clear what their political perspective was yeah and the show ends it's like the end of the tour and we're going to get in the bus and go home. Mm-hmm. I'm like, 
heading for the back door, like pretty much right after the show. And hear this woman like say, "Hey, you know, get, get you got a second? And I'm like, "A turn and start talking to her." And it's that woman who's like in the front row, mega yeah. hat. She's like, "Man, that song, that song, Republicratic mm-hmm. Convention." That is exactly why we need Donald Trump as president. <laughs> and I'm just like, I was like, both found it extremely humorous and wanted to cry at the same time. You're right. <laughs> I, but it was just like one of those things. So like, I don't know. The moral of the story is, uh, you know, your art can have intent, but at the moral, at the end of the day, like, uh, our art is perceived by people. Yeah, it goes through their own filter. I think Wilco had and, a line about how once it's once it's out of your hands, it's out of your hands. Yeah, and, you know now it belongs to everyone. Yeah, yeah because just meaning that like everyone takes you know their own their own perspective on it, and their own right. whatever lenses they're wearing. Exactly, you know? and yeah. those lenses are the gateways of perception. You know. Well, I don't want to be respectful of your time. Well, uh, thanks, getting, yeah, getting to that gotta, point, so, I can't uh, believe I got to go play a show. I know. <laughs> Crazy. What on huh? earth is going on, man? Well, thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, of course, man. So uh, how, do you, how do you want people to find you? Uh, um, not, a, not, a, not a big social media guy, but... Uh, well, you they know... Go, they can go find your new album, right? Yeah, and I mean, I do still do the social media thing. I just don't particularly enjoy mm-hmm. it. But it's, it's, you know, Facebook, I have a mm-hmm. professional page on there. Yeah, Adam Gruel. It's G R E U E L, and also uh, on Instagram at sure. Adam Gruel, and uh, I will never tweet. Never <laughs> tweet. Yeah, good for you, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, t- 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 wait, now I'm, now I'm now I'm gonna say it backwards. Tangerine quarantine. Ah, uh, quarantine, quarantine tangerine, tangerine and low quarantine. income porridge. You low can find porridge, those yeah. like uh, you know, if, uh, you can find them. They're on Spotify. There are those Spotify. people can buy them too, right? All that stuff. It's vinyl, yeah. you got vinyl. Got vinyl. Got to have the vinyl. Yeah. Yep, it's uh, Adam Gruel Music Square Site. There you go. Go find it, guys. Yep. Good stuff. Thank you. So hey, appreciate you being on. I have all my guests ended by saying, "Keep it awesome." So keep it awesome. Ah, uh, keep it awesome. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Can I-